One hundred years ago, on the banks of the Sugar River in western New Hampshire, the bustling city of Claremont offered the best of both country and city living. A quiet place among rolling hillsides, with good jobs and solid homes, plenty of shops with local and imported goods, a beautiful opera house, and fresh food from surrounding farms. Today, Claremont is on track to return to its former luster. Those who discover it first will be the lucky ones. In 1762, Moses Spafford and David Lind of Connecticut were the first settlers to realize the full potential of this place. Falling water, tillable land, and access to trade routes were all here. These men were fortunate to be granted land highly favored by the royal governor. Back in 1740 or 1750, Governor Benning Wentworth took 200 acres of northern Charlestown, southern Claremont, northern Springfield, Vermont, and Wethersfield, Vermont, and had what he called the governor's farm. And that was the finest land in New Hampshire, Vermont at that time. Early mills, sawmills and grist mills, built along the Sugar River, took advantage of the river's 250-foot drop on its sweep through Claremont. Hillsides were cleared. Sheep farming was a natural fit. With water power and wool plentiful, Claremont farmers and millers were well positioned to ride the wave of the so-called merino craze of the early 1800s. The city's role as a textile producer was established. A major thoroughfare of its day, the second New Hampshire Turnpike opened in 1802, running from Claremont to Amherst and beyond, putting Claremont on the map, both as an accessible source of quality goods and as an exceptional place to live and work. By the mid-1830s, both the upper village and lower village of Claremont were developing, somewhat competitively. To ensure the prominence of the upper village, a group of investors built a large modern mill near the present Opera House Square. Known as Monadnock Mill No. 1, now the state office building, it opened in 1841 as a cotton textile mill. For the next 90 years, Claremont would grow as a manufacturing city. Construction of mills number two and three followed to accommodate the boom in cotton textile manufacturing that was sweeping New England. As the textile business flourished through the mid-1800s, so did the city. Parks, farms, and a busy commercial center coexisted happily. Residents could work, shop, and find entertainment all within an easy walk. It was a vibrant small city. In 1872, Jacquard looms were installed to produce highly decorative Marseille and Madelesque cloth. These superbly detailed tablecloths, bedspreads, and napkins from Monadnock Mills were treasured in homes across the country. The mills were busy, and there were jobs aplenty. In the 25 years following 1880, the city population nearly doubled. The Fisk Free Library, the Claremont Hotel, the Hunton Blocks, and the Pride of Claremont, the Opera House, were all built during these boom years. With its oak-trimmed lobby, elaborate decoration, and superb acoustics, this architectural landmark made Claremont the cultural center for the region. Textile manufacturing throughout New England declined after World War I. Competition from the South and relatively high transportation costs contributed to the end of textile production in Claremont. Monadnock Mills closed in 1932. The mills were not altogether abandoned after the textile business left. Pearl Wainshaw remembers how she and her husband came to be mill owners. At first we used the mill for storage, but then we decided to buy it. Business was good. Phil and Pearl Wainshaw sold quality furniture with casual terms. Uh, my husband would say, well, if you want, you can just pay it uh, by the week or even by the month. Well, we were very gracious. <laughs> it was that type of a place. That's why they like to shop there. The 50s and 60s saw other businesses thrive in Claremont. Mrs. Wainshaw remembers a typical shopping night. It was a boom town on Friday nights. I mean, you couldn't get across the Elm Street. 
Oh yeah, people would come from Hanover, New Hampshire to shop on Water Street. And the stores were open late because there were a lot of customers coming in and then they would use other places like to eat and things like that when things were booming. And it was one of those towns where there was a lot going on. After the Wayneshalls closed their business, the mills were mostly unoccupied for years. As in many American cities, the bustling downtown became a thing of the past. The last mill to see manufacturing was Woven Label, which closed in the early 1980s. Over the ensuing years, the mills had few tenants and maintenance flagged. These were the darkest years for the Monadnock mills. Fortunately, though the buildings were out of use and subject to the ravages of time and weather, they were acquired by the city and buttoned up with an eye toward future renovation. Over the intervening years, individual developers came forward, but a successful redevelopment plan for the mills never materialized. At times, the challenge of finding a way to renovate all three mills at once seemed insurmountable. Then, a positive turn followed requests for developers issued by the city in 2004. An early respondent was John Illick of the REARC Company of South Burlington, Vermont, who was interested in the Peterson Mill. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the uh, buildings themselves were the main attraction. Uh, terrifically beautiful pieces of architecture, obviously underutilized for the last 20, 30, 40 years, in a beautiful setting. You know, the, the river district or the mill district on the Sugar River in Claremont is a spectacularly beautiful setting uh, in a beautiful geography. And the buildings are screaming for somebody to, you know, give them a little tender loving care. Next to express interest in the mills was Alex Ray, founder and president of the Common Man Group of Restaurants, who had come to Claremont to look at some other buildings, but he found them uninteresting. But I hung around town myself and fell in love with the mills on the river. So I found that afternoon I went over to the planning board, met the people that are in business development and planning, and they also were amazingly positive. So between those two things, I said, I'm coming back. Uh, we get a call from Alex Ray, who had done a wonderful market study. He, he'd come into Claremont, uh, unknown, a week before, and gone up and down the street and just asked people what they'd like to see in a new restaurant in Claremont, or if they thought they needed one. The results of that impromptu survey were clear. Alex was convinced that Claremont was ready for a new full-service restaurant with conference facilities, and that the woven label mill was the place. Still unaccounted for was the mill with the greatest renovation challenges, mill number two, the Wayne Shaw. Alex's enthusiasm was infectious. He approached his friend and business partner, Rusty McClear. Uh, he came back from there one day and said, uh, boy, I've just come through Claremont. They've got a project going over there, some great old mills. Let's go take a look. Um, I was probably less enthusiastic than he was at that point. Um, but he was right in his enthusiasm, and we're looking forward to a very exciting project. Rusty and Alex envisioned an inn and spa using part of the Wayneshaw Mill, but the building still needed another partner. So we thought it would come last, and it would maybe come as a, as a third kind of very separate project sometime in the future. And then uh, out, you know, lo and behold, Red River Computer Company looking for new expanded space, and uh, all of a sudden that building is kind of the, the centerpiece uh, of the project. It was going a different direction before we got there. It was going to be a very slow process, but when Anthony Lyons and Nancy Merrill and Guy Santigate started pulling in other, uh, other companies to move there, all of a sudden we, it became obvious that this could be a development of three mills and a wonderful partnership, and the city has embraced the idea.